One atmospheric wine bar, two original restaurants, one of the most exciting wine estates in the country, and a classic historical English pub. Damp, isn't it? <laughs> Fortunately, wine is liquid sunshine bottled. Today, I'm going to be your tour guide to take CEO of Coravan, Greg Lambrecht, on a tour of several of my favourite venues across London and the South East, in the vehicle of choice being an iconic London black cat. Tell me about this place because I gather this is the first wine bar care of Coravan. One of the things that, that Coravan does so well is allow people to explore a variety of different wines. And what better way to do that than to open up our own wine bar? Coravan gives permission. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, fearless, right? You should, be, you should have freedom to drink whatever you want by the taste, by the glass. It's never long uh, when I'm with you <laughs> before something wonderful appears, generally in a crystal glass of some description. <laughs> so I believe the challenge here is to appreciate, work out, uh, deduce how long this bottle has been under Coravan Sparkling. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm not going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> it smells fantastic, first of all. Uh, what a wonderful nose. Lots of integrity of, uh, of bubbles, I must yeah. say, still there. Yeah, yeah. We saw that when you poured it. It tastes fantastic. I mean, it's, uh, it's in beautiful condition. It's got all of that wonderful fruit. It's got the great acidity. It's got this marvelous mouthfeel and perlage. So I, you know, there's, there's nothing that would give you a clue that this bottle had been opened other than just now. Um, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's basically identical. But, so it does come down to the psychology of Arnaud. It feels invigorating, fridge fresh, I'm saying a week. Well, um, I, uh, I, I, uh, I think he's, he's craftier than that. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to guess that this is out uh, maybe three, three to four weeks. Did I see okay. a twitched eyebrow there? Not at all. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Poker face. Well, um, actually, it's right in the middle. Well, I have to say that was open two weeks ago. Two weeks. Yeah. Uh, Douglas, Douglas wins. <laughs> <laughs> what is the longest that you've had uh, a bottle of sparkling open here at the wine bar? We opened, reopened one of them about four months after, wow. and we still had bubbles. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. we still had bubbles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. four months. Yeah. Well, thank you for this challenge. We're on our way to Trivet to meet a brave sommelier who designs his wine list by historical chronology. This is one of the most historically focused and future gazing wine lists you'll encounter in the world. Oh, I can't wait. Thank you very much. Isa, nothing is flatly excluded on this wine list from 7000 BC to the present day and future gazing towards Mars. Your list is one of the most fascinating I've ever encountered. And of course, you've just won a Michelin star for the restaurant and Michelin sommelier of the year. Congratulations. Congratulations. How do you feel? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. May it please then have you. May that Michelin star only grow and last until Mars. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So tell me a bit about this, this concept of, 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 of the wealth of history. It and I just, I just wanted to make it a bit more exciting for people to look at and to create a conversation between the people who serve the wine and who drink the wine. So it's that time again, uh, Greg. More public embarrassment? <laughs> Prepared for it? More ritual shaming. <laughs> I believe you've developed an aeration device, a wine shower, um, as, as you've called it before. Yes. What I would like to do is to set Isa the challenge of pouring three versions of the same wine which he will explain in due course. But for this, I cannot allow you to have, firstly, any access to information okay. <laughs> <laughs> or access to your eyes, to your vision. 
So I'm going to give you a blindfold. Oh my goodness. For this part of the challenge. Yeah, appropriately uh, blind, <laughs> blind tasting. It's a little kinky, but <laughs> I'm, I'm in, I'm in. All right, I, I can no longer see. Yeah, so there are many ways that the aerator works. Uh, I've never explained it blindfolded, but it uh, breaks the stream up into 32 separate streams that then become droplets, very tiny droplets, and that dramatically increases the surface area of the wine. Beautiful. The aerator works in two ways uh, to, to open the wine up. One is to increase the surface area of the wine, uh, dramatically increasing the, aer the aeration surface. And then the other is by shaking dissolved gases out of the wine, like sulfur. OK, Greg, you can uh, remove the, the, All right. the, the vision uh, prohibiting device. Somehow it's, call it. it's awfully relaxing. Good uh, job. <laughs> in, in there. So we have a challenge in front of us, of course, uh, to, well, for you to work out which has been decanted for a minimum of four hours conventionally, okay. which has been through the Coravan wine aerator, and which has been drawn through the Coravan device without the aerator. I am looking forward to trying this. It's uh, So we should have one that's brand new, one that's somewhere in the middle, and one that's the most open. So, uh, okay. First of all, that's a... Lovely nose. Oh wow! Wow! Yeah, three very different noses on the on the three wines. I always get this wrong. Um, I always get this wrong because uh, it changes depending upon the wine. Um, but there are three very different wines here, both in nose and in palate. So um, this one, uh, I believe, is the one that has been open for four hours, is my belief, and I'm sticking to it, even though I might be wrong. Um, and it was on the nose, predominantly. And then the palate of this one, the second one, interestingly, is the most smooth, the least tannic grip, the... Mm. I, I'm thinking you poured them in reverse order, I guess. I don't know. And this is the public shaming. Four hours, aerator, non-aerator. So you are entirely correct on the third wine in that that has been drawn as normal with Coravan without the aeration. Okay. However, on the first two, you got it... Reversed. Reversed. So in fact, number one has been through the device. Wow, it's, that's amazing. And uh, two has been decanted minimum of, of four hours. Wow, yeah. that is amazing. I would have guessed that this, I did guess that this was four hours. Yeah. Um, the nose is the most open, the most uh, of the three. And it's amazing the effect, because these two were much more similar than this one. I agree. Yeah, right? In, in especially the tonic. Especially, especially the tonic. This one had so much grip yeah. that uh, it was almost hard to drink. And then these two were both beautifully open. My experience with these wines, if I were a guest, if my experience was this, the third uh, unaerated, undecanted wine, I would think differently about this wine than if I had it like this. Right? It changes my, my experience. I never thought about that. And this is a wine that you decanted for four hours. And you simply don't have four hours for a consumer unless you know they're coming. Um, so to be able to open the wine up in that way, make it so much more approachable, so delicious, um, so, so engaging. You see all the fruit, the wonderful nose, the, all the understructure behind the tannins. Uh, it's really, uh, it's, it's amazing how much it changes your experience. I would, actually, I wonder if it would affect the pairing that you could do with the wine. Do you pair for tannic structure? Well, uh Actually, I always pair more with structure of the wine and the fruit than the individual flavors. Huh. I, I pay very little attention to the actual flavor itself. I find this if you match this structure, you hit the right mark often. There we go. I never heard that. That's a great idea. That's, that's how I approach to it anyway. Yeah. People might disagree. So where is this Cabernet from? from? Turkey. Turkey? Yeah. Ah, there like we go. Like yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much for my first Turkish red wine. I've never had a red wine from Turkey before. Hello, guys. Hello, hello. 
Nadia, Nadia, thank you good for to having us. You. Today. Doing great. You're really looking welcome. forward to this. Please. We've come thank to you. meet Nadia Khan, dynamic sommelier for the frog. Nadia Khan, great to see you. Lovely to have you. <laughs> Wonderful guys. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Me too. Very curious. <laughs> Curiosity applies to your very special wine list. Can you tell Greg and I a little bit about the the feelings that go into the, the chapters, the categories? Uh, the wine list here, here at Frog is a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, we have divided it by concepts and fillings actually and uh, it's a way for us to interact with our guests in order to introduce them to unusual varieties for instance or unusual places of production and to um, help them sourcing the wine that will complement at the best their uh, choice of food. Yeah. So it's an alternative way to um, showcase amazing wines from all over the world in a different style. Yeah. I'd love to challenge Greg um, actually to, yeah. uh, to tell me your mood so and I, we'll I'm, find a wine from that. Uh, I am a creator of new things, uh, Corbin, uh, things that never have existed before. And so in general, I feel a little bit maverick. So uh, I don't know how you would pair with that feeling, but I can't wait to find out. I got something for you to All right. taste. All right. Ta-da. Ooh. Ah, OK, blind. OK. So you said you're feeling maverick? Yes. To me, this wine could be only described as a maverick one. OK. And there are several reasons behind. So if you're happy, Yep. I'll just pour a little bit for you. You tell me what you think about it. All right, awesome. It's great that you can still use Corbin on a bottle that's wrapped up in paper. <laughs> 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 okay, so Maverick is at least a little bit red. All right, I'm dying with curiosity to try. Thank you. Oh, wow, what a beautiful nose. Gosh, that's... Uh all present, isn't it? It's yeah. vivid, it's exuberant. That kind of stony too. This one makes you think in a different way and uh, it certainly has matched my mood and, and of, of both enthusiasm and being a maverick. It, uh, it's really lovely. Um, I probably have to try to guess what this is. <laughs> Go for it. Oh no, public embarrassment. Um, <laughs> no. You know, it, it almost reminds me of a really beautiful Barbera or, um, or a very light uh, Syrah in some ways. Um, it, it's, it, and, and I love both of those. The tannins make me think whatever it is is young. Um, like this is going to age beautifully. It's delicious now. Like, I would certainly drink it now, but I would love to see what this tastes like in, in 10 or 15 years. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully life is, is that long <laughs> so that I will be able to drink this wine over time. Um, so if I had to guess, it is old world. So I'm kind of class uh, guessing in a classical way. Mm. It's, a, it's an old world wine. Um, maybe I'm going to guess it's somebody's version of a beautiful Syrah, I think. You nailed it. Did I really? Certainly nailed it. Oh my god, I'm it not publicly Syrah. embarrassed. It is, is Syrah. Syrah. Ah, okay, alright. Okay, you might not know where it's made and by who yes. it's been made. But you nailed the great variety. Okay, so I'm That's dying fantastic. to find out where it's from. Okay. So where, how, is this, how is this a Maverick wine? <laughs> Present. Somebody already here. Oh wow. Morocco, right? M what? <laughs> oh my goodness. This is my very first wine from uh, Morocco. <laughs> Syrah de Morocco. Yes. <laughs> I know Syrah it. De yes, my gosh. Yes. No, yeah. Alain Grayo. Yes, yeah. So, Nadia, how has Coravin uh, changed what you can do in uh, showing these wines uh, to your guests? Well, here we have um, amazing tasty menus and related wine pairings. Oh, very cool. So for each single course, we provide a choice of wine. Wow. And Coravan, I call it my best friend, <laughs> because literally is a great opportunity for the guests to uh, in, enjoy a glass of wine out of a premium bottle, which otherwise 
wouldn't be open just for, for a single glass. So uh, we use the caravan a lot and the caravan allows you to pour a little bit of each ah. without wasting the rest of the wine. Yeah. So I can't wait to come back. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Thank you. You'll be more than welcome. You need to come and see us. We're en route to Hundred Hills, tucked away in the Stoner Valley near Henley. On the way, I ask Greg some questions. Can you give me a sense of the timeline that you've been on the Coravan project from invention of the first device that hit the market to now? Oh, I, I, I measure that timeline in the height of my son. So my, I invented it actually when my, my wife at the time was pregnant uh, with our second child. So she had stopped drinking completely. And that was, he was born in January of 1999. So uh, that is when I came up with it. And then the good functional prototype that I used uh, to really test different needles, different gases, different pressures, um, was in 2003. Uh, I, it was a part-time project. I was running my medical company. So I did this on weekends at home. I literally have a machine shop in my, in a little machine shop in my basement. And so the first one that left my house went to my friend who was getting married as a very odd wedding gift. <laughs> Three bottles of wine, and I had to make one that, that didn't require an octopus with a PhD to operate, so I, re I reduced the number of buttons to two. Um, and then uh, he wound up showing his friends, and people that came over to my house saw it. I didn't know that this was a product other people were interested in. I, I, this is just how I drank wine. I didn't know that others wanted to drink this way. At the time, I was drinking Barolo and California Cabernet. And I remember friends would come over and say, sure, it works with that wine. Uh, that is resistant to oxidation. You should try it with white burgundy. And so I would go out, I'd buy half a case of white burgundy, and I would core it in a bottle, write the date and the needle and the gas, and then I would come back in a month and blind taste it against another bottle from the same half case, and then six months come back again and then one year two years and five years your son getting higher and taller as time went on i think all levels of of consumer can enjoy corbin um, we have different models now at different price points so even the younger uh, people that are just getting into wine uh, can can enjoy it all the way to the experts um, i really don't want it to be connected with snobbery right i want it to just be a tool that people use like a corkscrew uh, anyone can use a corkscrew. If they enjoy wine, they can use a corkscrew to, to get access to their wine. If they enjoy wine, they can use Coravin to get access to their wine. And I want it to be the democratizer, as much as possible, of wine. And maybe every day is not worth a 50 pound uh, or 100 pound bottle of wine, but every day is worth a 10 pound glass, right, or a 15 pound glass. Uh, so if we can create that accessibility, it should spread across all levels of wine interest and consumption. Greg, I've brought you to this beautiful estate on the, in the Stoner Valley, and there is a reason for this. It was the first estate in England to use Coravan Sparkling. Thank you very much, by the well, way. Well, welcome, Greg. Yes, Thank you for having me here. You. I'm excited. We've, we've loved the, the Coravan Sparkling. I loved the, the first bottle of wine that I had of yours. Beautiful. You know, here we make beautiful vintage wines, often in very small quantities. It's a bit like the boutique wineries you, you have in all over Napa sure, and Sonoma yeah. and you know it's fantastic to be able every glass is precious to us you yeah. know we're making vintage only wines and although we have lots of visitors here you know we like everybody to try some of the rarer wines and it really helps us to do that if we can keep them in perfect condition for two weeks three weeks even four weeks as That's we right. do that so wow. it really helps what a gorgeous spot well, maybe it's, time, maybe it's time to introduce you to one of them. I'm really excited to do this, <laughs> although, you know, in, in blind tasting, I've really confronted a lot of challenges today, and I'm looking forward to it. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say what you're going to taste today is, is one of our most common wines. Okay. It's, it's, certainly, it's certainly one that excites the masters of wine and a lot of the critics. And I think when people come to a winery, they want to know what's special about it. Yeah. So we make, you make some wines in very small quantities that are really different and very special. Uh, and you're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna test one of those on you today. That's really marvelous. I am your, <laughs> your happy test subject. Ooh, Greg, 
Okay, what a beautiful <laughs> color. Winemaker Stephen. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, cheers. Cheers. Yeah, welcome to uh, Thank it's you for having me. Cheers. Cheers, Dougie. Oh, what a great nose. Uh oh, here I go again. What do you think <laughs> of the, what do you think of the color? It's beautiful. It's uh it's almost like a copper and and uh, strawberry. The grapes you're, you're tasting were the first, the first we harvest every year, although these were left till quite late in the harvest. Well, the first thing is that there's a <laughs> smile on my face immediately, and that comes from, well, the, one of the beautiful things about English sparkling is that it has this wonderful acidic backbone that I so love and look for and hope for in a sparkling yeah. wine, because it makes it such a perfect pairing wine with food, right? We really, we really look for, for uh, uh, restaurants to pair this on there on their tasting menus for hell. So what I love is I, I'm stalling, because I, <laughs> I, I know that at one point I'm gonna have to guess exactly what this is. Uh, other than a marvelous English sparkling, I would guess somewhere around 2018 in vintage. I, I'm only guessing 2000. <laughs> well, that's a very good guess. Yeah. <laughs> we made three, three rosé wines in 2018, and this was certainly one of them. Okay, well, there we go. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm at least close in, <laughs> in that regard. But uh, you said Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir, and you know that would be the assumption if you were drinking something like this. Um, Pinot Meunier is the other uh, that I'm obs absolutely obsessed with. I don't right. know how much Pinot Meunier you grow. No, only Pinot Noir and yeah, Chardonnay. Only here, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So this it's is not a, a very pure. You know, if you're going to drink 100% um, Pinot Noir, it's, it's rare in England to get to get to the stage where you can get a still Pinot to really express itself properly. And so I think today, you know, the, these, 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 this form of Pinot is a beautiful way to drink English Pinot Noir. It's fantastic. So this form of Pinot, so there's something <laughs> going on here that I do not know, uh, but you know, I'm pretty close with the Pinot Noir Rosé <laughs> from 2018. Very well, it's and English. Very you know, well. This is our, this is our Rosé de Seigne. Ah. So it's a bled rosé, made in the old fashioned way Beautiful. of making rosés, where you do actually de-stem, macerate the grapes. And we, we just collect, we collect the free run of the juices that they press themselves for five, six, seven hours, tasting all the time, ferment in barrel, no filtering, no fining, ferment again, uh, keep for two, three years and, and, and bring out, uh, so, so completely pure 100% Pinot Noir from a single parcel in what was probably the best year England's seen for growing Pinot Noir ever, 2018. Beautiful. Wow, it's gorgeous. Gorgeous. So I know that you've been using Corbin Sparkling uh, for the longest time in, uh, of any winery in uh, the United Kingdom. Have you tried it on all of your different... Uh... We have. We, we've tried it on all of our wines. I mean, it's particularly applicable to our limited edition wines where we're making, you know, this is 600 bottles a year. And so for the last six months or so, we've been, we've been using Coravan on all of our wines, but particularly our Blanc de Blancs and our Seigneurs, just to keep them really in perfect condition. We've really found that it keeps this Seigneur in particular, you know, really fresh and vibrant because that's what that's what sure. this wine's all about yeah and so even after we find even after three weeks a month if that's the last the last glass in the bottle you know it's still just as if we'd opened it so we thank you so much we, oh. we we love we love we love the we love well the thank Garaban. you for promoting it and also for testing it out i mean yeah. i did not have the opportunity to test much english sparkling during the pandemic we really, we've really tested it very thoroughly and uh we're very happy on with all our wines so that's you'll awesome. be seeing it on our magnums as well and, Ooh, uh, perfect uh, yeah so that we can finally introduce people to glasses glasses from our magnums which is even harder for us to do. Do you find a big difference between the wines that you uh, age in, in yeah, we really bottle do. and in magnum? In fact, in fact we, we, the, more, the more I do this the more I think about the wines in magnum as being different wines from the huh. wines in, yeah. <laughs> in bottles. They really do evolve in a different way and so some of the wines we, we have from we have one beautiful wine Cremo number two from 17 which is, is now quite evolved is beautiful rich very succulent very delicate. The magnum of it still has a freshness and a tautness which makes it almost an entirely different wine. And so we really actually begin to introduce them to our customers and, and to our, our restaurants and, and bars as, as being quite different. separate. Yep. They're quite different. Uh, and allows us to go in, and particularly when we go in and taste with restaurants, we can go around you know, half a dozen restaurants Here's what a magnum tastes like. Here's, here's what a magnum tastes like. Here's what a magnum tastes like. Here's a magnum. We can't open a magnum in every, every time we sure. go through. Yeah. We only make a few hundred a year. Our consumers, our wine club members here, absolutely love that. I mean, that's why, they've, that's why they've become wine club members. They want to understand the differences in the way we make wines, the way our wines evolve and follow the journey. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the Coraman really helps us do that because as they pop in, they can try a glass. We can just open a... We know it'll be a perfect, a perfect glass of wine, and uh, we, can, we can keep that for the next the next hundred club member coming along. I love it. I love it. I gotta get be, I gotta become a member exactly. as long as you can ship to the we'll, United we'll, States in some way. We'll get to the States, don't worry. I would love that. I would love that. Very good. And uh, can't wait to taste from a magnum. Yeah, very That'd good. Be awesome. look forward to that. Yeah, cheers. cheers. 
time to discover how Coravan Pivot enables venues to expand their food pairing options at our final stop, the Black Horse Tay. Thanks, Gary. Where we'll meet General Manager Abder Raymond. Welcome to the Black Horse. Uh, we are located at the moment in the historic town of uh, Tain. Uh, so I used to work for an Italian chain before this and took the opportunity to move across counties uh, and came to work for Raymond Blanc. So we opened this pub back in 2017. So I don't take it personally, but I noticed that you don't yet use Coravin uh, on your menu, but you have a really wonderful wine list. Uh, and so what's your philosophy on, on the wine list and, and, uh, and what you serve by the glass and what you don't serve by the glass? So the wines are actually chosen based on, they're, they're perfectly paired with the, with, the, with the menu items, the food items on the, on, on, on the menu. Uh, being a uh, traditional English pub, we just want to make sure that we have wine, we have something for everyone. So it's a nice house, uh, white, red or rosé uh, for people who are just looking to dine on a Monday to Thursday. Some more premium wines uh, for people who are coming to treat their loved ones and stuff. Yeah, so we, we're currently using the old traditional method of vacuuming. Uh, yeah. Back into the wine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I know that we selected a couple of wines that we're going to try to pair with uh, the steak and ale pie, and uh, I noticed that these were two wines that were not on your buy the glass list. Of course, I'm a huge Chardonnay fan. I'm a Rhone fan in general, uh, and so uh, we'll try these two different wines and and see what they're like with steak and ale, and it gives me a chance to demonstrate our latest and greatest, the Pivot Pro. How does it look? Ah, so I, I think. With wine, the key thing is you want to prevent oxygen from touching the wine. Okay. And so there are two times when oxygen touches the wine. One when you uh, open the bottle, but most importantly while you're pouring. And so what we do is we remove the, the closure, whatever it is, cork, screw cap, uh, plastic cork, whatever. You replace it with our stopper. Uh, the stopper has a valve. And we use a tube that goes through the stopper, you tip it sideways, and then instead of air touching the wine, we displace the wine from the bottle using argon, one of the noble gases, an inert gas that has no reaction with the wine. And that pushes the wine out of the bottle and into your glass, tip up to stop pouring, remove the tube from the bottle, and then recap the, uh, the stopper, and your wine is just the same as if it was unopened, the last glass as good as the first, out to a month. So there's no wastage. And you can serve your great wines by the glass. I really am enthusiastic about this. This is, a, this is almost like a, like a holiday. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Oh, that looks wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Joe. Wow, OK. This is a, a magical moment that you rarely saw until we launched the Pivot, but the Corbin guy opening a bottle of wine. So it's, uh, it's not normally what I did. But we found actually that it doesn't make a difference if you open a bottle of wine very briefly and replace the stopper or the cork. Uh, very little air gets in, which is great. Yeah, so. Second. Yeah. There we are. Ah, good. <laughs> so you can actually leave the bottle open for a minute or two. And uh, it really doesn't create a problem. You just don't want to open, or you don't want to pour a glass and then simply place the stopper on the inside like so and you're ready to go. So I'll pour the, the first glass for us. I like to uh, put the tube in with the uh, cap pressed against the rest of the system. It just keeps it out of the way while you're pouring. And then if I can, I'll pour you a glass. Simply tip it, press the button, and you're pouring. And you can see how fast the, the pour speed is. It just takes a couple of seconds to, to fill a glass. That's super quick. Yeah. And there you go. It's also very accurate. Oh, yeah. Is you're pressing, it's pouring. You stop pressing, it stops pouring. It's really simple to use and really simple to understand. I like to give it a little bit of a shake as I take it out, just to make sure that it doesn't drip. And then simply snap the bottle closed. And you're set. You can store the one on its side. You can store it upright. Having that kind of a choice, to be able to select uh, whichever one of these that you might think is better. In fact, in reality, I would order both glasses of wine uh, because just that experience of tasting them both with uh, the steak and ale pie uh, is what makes, makes this so memorable. Got it, it's gorgeous. This is a, a wonderful meal. I'm coming back. Yeah, 
And so, five venues and 150 miles later, my day with Greg came to an end. It was an inspiration to spend time with some incredible personalities from the wine industry, as well as one man whose mission to change the way the world experiences wine continues to revolutionize the way it is served, sampled and savored across the industry.